I just want to say all the work that I'm really presenting today is in collaboration with my amazing graduate student, Adam Bear. And so even though I just happen to be the one who's standing in front of you, all the stuff I'm talking about is going to be very much in collaboration with him. What I'm talking about today is this idea of norms and the notion of normality, the notion of something being normal. So we have this intuitive sense that, for example, there might be a normal time to wake up in the morning, or there might be a normal kind of thing to eat for lunch. Then we also have notions of normality that apply to really central things in our life. We might have the notion of something like a normal marriage, or a normal way to do this job, a normal way for the president to respond to certain things. And these notions, this notion of normality, <coughs> seem to play a really essential role in the way we ordinarily understand our world. So this notion, the notion of normality that we may explain today, has been explored within existing research by a number of really different disciplines that have really taken that up quite separately. So for one thing, if you look at research on stereotyping and prejudice, the sense that people have about certain groups that are tending to derogate those groups, you see a lot of emphasis on this notion of normality. So if you ask why is it that people are sometimes prejudiced against sexual minorities, against people who are mentally ill, often the suggestion is that in some way these behaviors are regarded as abnormal. But then completely separately from that, if you look within linguistics and questions in formal semantics, there's often the suggestion that if we want to understand certain kinds of linguistic uh, expressions, expressions like generics, gradable adjectives, modals, then a helpful way of doing this is to employ this notion of normality. So for example, the great semanticist Abdelka Kratzer has argued that if you want to understand certain kinds of moguls, we're going to have to introduce some ordering that's, involved in, that's an ordering on normality. And then completely separate again from that, if you look at work within causal cognition, causal modeling, causal reasoning, there's often the suggestion that normality is playing some key role in the way people think about causation. That there are all sorts of different things that have to be the case in order for a given outcome to happen. But of all of those things, we don't think about all of them as being the cause. We only pick out the abnormal ones and regard those as the causes. And then, separate again from that, there's been a lot of work within political science arguing that a lot of the sort of aspects of things that are governing human behavior are not so much a matter of just having incentives that are placed on us, that if we do certain things, people actually punish us in, those, in certain ways for them, but rather that we have a certain sense of what's normal. So that, say, in a dictator game, we might think the normal amount to give is this certain amount, and then we would feel bad to give the other person less than that amount. So I want to emphasize before we go on two different things about all this existing work on normality. The first is that what this work is about, most fundamentally in the first instance, is how people think about normality. So human beings think about normality, and this plays an enormously important role in our lives. That's what we want to understand. Of course, yeah, we might also think that there's some philosophical question, the question which things truly are normal. What's the correct view about which things are normal? That second question is not one that I'm going to be taking up today. I'm going to be taking up just a straightforward empirical question, which things do human beings regard as abnormal, which things do human beings regard as normal? The second thing is that even though all of this different research takes, <coughs> uh, it sort of goes after the same question, this question about which things are normal, these fields have explored that question completely independently from each other. So there are people in formal semantics developing quite complex sort of mathematical, logical theories that involve normality. And then there are also people studying stereotyping and prejudice, where they think that certain kinds of stereotypes or prejudices we have against certain people have, a, have some relation to thinking that those certain behaviors as abnormal. But these kinds of research have taken place independently of each other. It's not as though there's a unified field of trying to understand normality insofar as it's related both to technical questions in formal semantics and to questions about the marginalizations of app groups. What I'm going to do today is exactly the opposite. So the idea is to develop just a general theory about normality, a theory that's just about the question, which things do people regard as normal? And this theory is supposed to under take advantage to help us understand a variety of different factors that just in general help to explain which things people think are normal and which things people think are abnormal. So we know that people's judgment about the normal play a role in an enormous number of different aspects of human cognition, shaping our lives in all sorts of different ways. And the hope is that we're not going to have to develop a different theory of normality for each of these different things. We're going to understand sort of what normality is, how people think about normality, and then everything from these really social kinds of questions to these really technical questions is going to fall out of that one theory. So what is normality? The first thing you might think of is that it seems to be like human beings are capable of thinking about different kinds of norms. Things that you might call norms, but that really are quite different from each other. On one hand, human beings seem to be capable of thinking of what you might call purely statistical norms. So, if you're just thinking about, say, the weather in Oregon, you might think, in Oregon, in the winter, it just tends to be really overcast. Just a statistical fact about Oregon weather. So if one winter in Oregon, it happened that it was a really sunny winter, it was really sunny every day, then that would be a violation of a statistical norm, which is, from a purely statistical perspective, just be an abnormal way for an Oregon winter to be. Then, 
separate from that, there are what you might call prescriptive norms. So these are norms that govern, that are, uh, reflect in some way how things are supposed to be or how they ought to be. So for example, in a given department, you might say, by their second year, graduate students are supposed to have fulfilled the following requirements. It might even be that the majority of the graduate students don't fulfill all those requirements by their second year. But still, all of those people, even though they're the majority, would have been failing to fill, fulfill the norm, they'd be violating the norm. So the second kind of norm, prescriptive norm, is not something purely statistical, but something prescriptive, something about how things ought to be, how they should be, how they're supposed to be. So what is the relation now between these two different kinds of norms in people's ordinary cognition? So one thought that you might have initially is that these are just two completely separate things. So human beings are thinking about, capable of thinking about statistical questions, they can think about statistical norms. Human beings are also capable of thinking about prescriptive questions, they can think about prescriptive norms. And then they can just think about each of these things, and for any given thing that's in front of them, they can think, does it violate or conform to the statistical norms? Okay, there's the answer to that question. And then separately from that, does it violate or does it conform to the prescriptive norms? And they could think about each of those things separately. But what I want to suggest today is that that's not how human beings think about the world. It's not that they keep these things separately. Instead, people seem to have this unified notion of just what is normal. So the judgment about what is normal is something that's partly affected by statistical norms. It's also partly affected by prescriptive norms. It's just this undifferentiated mixture of those two things. And the core idea is that that this thing, this undifferentiated notion of normality, is going to be the one that we most often use, most commonly use, to make sense of our lives. So of course, human beings are capable of really stopping to think about it and thinking, from a purely statistical perspective, is this common or uncommon? But the suggestion is going to be that that's not how we normally think about things. The default way of thinking about things is using this undifferentiated notion, and it's only with this kind of effort and a kind of more consciously controlled analytical way that we can separate out these two different questions. So let's just give an example of sort of this work. So you're, suppose you're thinking about just the normal amount of TV to watch in a day. So at first you might think, okay, there are two different kinds of questions we could ask here. We could ask a purely statistical question. We could just ask, what's the average amount of TV to watch in a day? And then we could ask a purely prescriptive question. We could ask the question, what's the ideal amount of TV to watch in a day? And then the first thought you might have is, these are just two unrelated questions that human beings can think about either. You can think about the average amount, you can think about the ideal amount. For any given thing, you can think of, is it higher or lower than the average? Is it higher or lower than the ideal? But the core suggestion is going to be that that's not how human beings think about that world. Instead, we can blend these two things together <laughs> into this undifferentiated notion, this notion of just what's the normal amount of TV to watch in a day? And this undifferentiated notion is not going to be exactly equal to the average, is not going to be exactly equal to the ideal, it's some kind of mix of these two things. And then the suggestion is going to be that it's this notion that we most commonly use to understand our lives. If you see someone just watching a certain amount of TV, you're not going to just naturally find yourself thinking, is it higher or lower than the statistical mean, the average? Or is it higher or lower than the ideal? You're going to think, is it higher or lower than just that normal amount of TV for a person to watch? And the normal is going to be a mix of the statistical norm and the prescriptive norm. So to address this kind of question, we ran a whole series of different studies. But today, I'm just going to talk really briefly about two. So just quickly about two of the studies we used to get, get a flow from this concept. So the first is just a purely correlational study. So in this study, we looked for a whole bunch of different domains <coughs> at what people think is average, what people think is ideal, and what people think is normal. So just what's the normal of t amount of TV to watch in a day? What's the normal amount of hours to exercise in a week? What's the normal amount percentage of middle school students to be bullied? What's the normal amount of books to read in a year? What's the normal percentage of students to cheat on an exam, and so forth? So uh, across all these different domains, we tried to choose things where people would think that the average and the ideal were different. So we just picked domains where people thought the average and ideal would be not the same, and then we wanted to know for each of those domains, what did people think would be normal? So one group of participants in each case was just <coughs> asked the average for each different domain. So if you were in this condition, you'd be asked, what would you guess is the average number of hours of TV that a person watches in a day? And then what would you guess is the average number of hours to exercise in a week? What's the average percentage of students in a middle school to be bullied, and so forth? Then another group of participants were asked about the ideal, so they were asked, for each of these domains, what do you think is the ideal number of hours of TV for a person to watch in a day? What's the ideal um, number of uh, 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 hours um, uh, um, to exercise in a week? What's the ideal percentage of students in a middle school to be bullied and so forth? So these domains were picked in such a way that for some of them, people would tend to think that the average was higher than the ideal. And then for others, they would tend to think that the average is lower than the ideal. And then the key question then was, what would people think is normal? In each of these cases, what would people think is the normal amount? So participants in a third condition were then asked for each of these domains, what is the normal amount of hours of TV for a person to watch in a day? What's the normal 
I'm not personally a uh, student in the middle school to be bullied. What's the normal number of hours to exercise in a week? I think it might be helpful before it's in the middle just to track on yourself. Just think, what is the normal amount of TV to watch a day? Just think first, what is it? And then think, what do you think now is the statistical average amount of TV for, to watch in a day? And just think whether you think these are the same thing. So what we observed for each of these different domains is this tendency whereby <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your enthusiasm. But the people don't think that the normal is the same as the average. It's just they see the normal as being intermediate between the average and the ideal. So people show this tendency that they don't people participants who ask what the normal amount is don't get the same answer as participants who ask what the average amount is. They also don't give the same answer as participants who ask or ask what the ideal amount is. They're giving an answer that's intermediate between those two. So then um, so across all these different domains, we're finding this basic pattern. Here I gave just two examples, but if you enter both these things, these things into a regression as predictors, what you find is that, unsurprisingly, the average predicts the normal. So if the average in a given domain is higher, the normal in the domain is going to be higher. But also, controlling for the average, you also see this effect that the ideal predicts the normal. So controlling for average, there's also a significant effect of the ideal. The more the ideal is high, the more people think that, that the normal is high. So, this first study that we just talked about is just a purely correlational study. We're not in any way manipulating what people think is average and ideal. People just think certain stuff is average and certain stuff is ideal. And then we ask, given that, what do people think is normal? So now we want to conduct an experimental study in which we actually control what people think is the average and what people think is the ideal, and then see what people think is the normal. So in the study, we wanted to use purely novel stimuli. But that I mean to talk about something where people don't come into it with any prior judgment. They've never heard of this thing before, so they have no idea what's average or what's ideal. We just tell them what's average and what's ideal. So to do this, we invented these little spheres called stagnars. And then <laughs> these stagnars can come in different lengths, just some kind of weird sphere. Presumably, people have no prior view coming to the experiment. What is the average length or what's the ideal length? And we're just trying to manipulate it. So participants in the, in the study are just randomly assigned to get some information about what's the average and what's the ideal. So the way they get that information is not that we just tell them this is the average and this is the ideal, it's that we give them a sample of these spheres, and then from the sample, you're clearly getting a certain sense about what the average is. It's just the sample average is giving you some sense of the population average. But then also, accompanying each individual sphere, we're giving them a letter grade from A to F. So A is a really good sphere, F is a really bad sphere, and so you're gradually getting a sense, at least on some sort of rough intuitive level, of what the average sphere um, length is and also what the ideal sphere length is. So I'll just show you what participants would actually get in this experiment. So they get a larger sample than you're, than you're going to get, but with a smaller sample size, this is approximately what participants would get. Oh, I'm not blocking these for people. It's so the letter gets over there. So going through those, you probably have some kind of at least rough intuitive sense of what the mean of the lengths was and what the ideal was. In the example that you just saw, the mean is this, and then the ideal was that. Mm -hmm. So then participants go through this kind of thing, and then they're just asked the following question. They're asked, based on what we've shown you, we're curious what you think a normal stagnar looks like. <laughs> so just adjust this slider to make the picture of the stagnar look like a normal stagnar. You can adjust it left, you know, with the left arrow and the right arrow. You just keep adjusting it until it looks normal, and then you stop. Then the key question is, in what way would people's judgments about what's normal be affected by our manipulation of what's average and what's ideal? And what we find is that, unsurprisingly, when we change the average, that changes people's judgments about what's um, normal. And also, when we change the ideal, people's judgments about what's normal are changed. And then, so that there's this tendency, which we see again, people's judgments about the normal segment are even the average stagnar length is somehow intermediate between the average stagnar length and the ideal stagnar length. So we're getting here is at least some initial evidence that people's judgments on what's normal is somehow this undifferentiated blend of statistical judgment and a prescriptive judgment. And ultimately what we're going to try to suggest is that all of these different kinds of things that are affected by people's intuitions on what's normal are affected by this thing, by this blended undifferentiated notion. So, so far we've been just talking about how people think about normality, just which things do people think is normal. You know, the key question is, what is the role of this thing, of normality, in people's cognition? And so, to go after this question, we teamed up with this guy, Julian Fire Edinger, in the psych department. So, to, so uh, uh, an initial thought that you might have about the role of normality is that it just has something to do with the content of the judgments you make about stuff. So say you're thinking about something, you might think, is this thing normal, or is this thing not normal? 
And then in some way, that judgment, the judgment that this thing is normal or the judgment that this thing is not normal, is going to affect, in some way, how you think about it. You might think that's the core idea of normality. That normality affects the content of the judgment, what, what thing we judge about, the things that we think about. But there's also another thing that you might think is playing, the, the, another kind of role that you might think it might play. And this is just which things we make any judgment about in the first place. So sometimes you're thinking about stuff, but you can, can't think about everything. You can only think about some stuff. So there's a pro higher probability of thinking about certain things and a lower probability of thinking about other things. What I want to suggest now is that this is actually a really important kind of aspect of, our, of the role of morality and cognition. And in fact, the suggestion is going to be that it is the primary one. That fundamentally, what's really important about morality is it plays a role in which stuff you think about at all. And then the impact that it has on what you think about the stuff that you think about is kind of downstream from that first thing. It's downstream from the fact that normality affects which things you think about at all. So just to give an illustration of what kind of thing I mean. Think about the domain of decision making. So say you're trying to make a decision. Right, so say you're in a restaurant, you're just thinking, what should I order? So you might think, okay, I could have this burger, I could have this salad, and now you're just thinking about reasons for and against them. You might think, I don't know, this is healthier, or you might think that's tastier or cheaper or something. Then you're trying to weigh these different decisions. And then there's some way in which you decide between the options that you're considering. There's been a tremendous amount of research on this question. When you're considering certain options, how do you decide between them? But a fact that just will be immediately obvious as soon as you think about it is that there are also, also all sorts of other options that you just never ever thought about at all. So instead of ordering one of these things, you could have just run into the kitchen and just started stealing things directly out of their pots. Or you could have just reached down and started eating your own shoe. But it's not as though you were reflecting on that. It's not as though you thought, well, should I eat the salad or should I eat my shoe? My shoe would definitely not be tasty. I should eat the salad. It's just that these options just don't occur to you at all. So in trying to understand why you may choose the option that you do, there are some two different things that are playing a role. One is, all the options that you considered, why did you choose this one as opposed to the other one you considered? And the second thing is, why did you consider these certain options as opposed to any other options? And you might think that that second one's actually more fundamental, that almost every single option was eliminated in that second step of just which things do you think about at all? And then your actual decision-making process was about a very tiny number of options that you considered. So that when we're trying to model this kind of thing more formally, the way we do it is this. We say there's a bunch of different options. And then for each option, you can compute the expected value of that option in the situation you're in. So in the specific situation you're in, you can think, um, you know, if I chose this option, how good is it likely to be? And then you can think about which option has the highest expected value. So one way you could solve this problem about what to do is that you could just choose the option that has the highest of all the expected values, and you could just do that. But you think about what human beings are like, we could never solve the problem that way. Well, we could never think about all of the different options and then think about the expected value of each. So a different way of thinking about this problem is this. For each of these different options, independent of anything about the, really the details of the situation you're in, you just have a sense regarding that option of how worth considering that option is. So for each option, you might have some sense of like, is this worth considering or is this some basic thing that's not worth considering? And then you consider only the options that you regard as like the most worth considering, and for those options, you compute the expected value only of them. So you're not computing the expected value of any of the other options. And then you're going to choose the option that has the highest expected value of the ones that you consider. So you think about it this way. If you want to ask, answer, answer the question, why did you think, why did you choose this option? Part of the reason is because of its expected value after you considered it. But part of it is, why did you consider that option as opposed to any of this? So here I'm just giving this one example. It's an example of what's expected value in decision making. But the thing I'm trying to say is supposed to be perfectly general. So it applies to decision making, also applies to all sorts of other aspects of cognition. It's just there's certain things that we think about, other things we don't think about. And now there's a question, why do I think about certain things and not think about other things? You know, I think the answer by now should be obvious. So the suggestion is going to be that there's this, this dependent variable, just which stuff comes to mind. And the suggestion is going to be the stuff that comes to mind, the stuff you think about, it's just the normal stuff. And then um, statistical and prescriptive considerations both play an explanatory role in determining which thing you regard as normal. And then which thing you regard as normal plays a role in which things come to mind. So as a result, both statistical and prescriptive stuff plays a role in which things come to mind. So again, we ran a whole bunch of different studies on this topic. And again, I'm just going to talk about two. The first one is this correlational study. In this correlational study, participants just got each of these different domains. And then they were asked a really different question about the domains. So the question was just this. We're curious, what's the first number that comes to your mind? So there's no need to deliberate about this, and there's no correct answer. We genuinely just want to know, what's the first number that pops into your head? We can now ask, with regard to each of these different domains, again, this is a bi-item analysis, just as we discussed earlier. 
for each of these, um, for each of these different ones, we can compute the mean of people's responses, and we can ask how the mean of people's responses about what comes to mind, to what degree it's predicted by the average, and to what degree it's predicted by the ideal. And what we get is this familiar pattern that, for uh, just as you might expect, in the domains where the average is higher, the first number that comes to mind is higher. But also, controlling for that, in the domains where people think the ideal is higher, the first number that comes to mind is higher. I don't know if you feel it yourself, just intuitively, as you're going through these things, that the amount of TV that first comes to mind isn't the average amount of TV, it's not the ideal amount of TV, just some amount that's intermediate between those two. So, so far, we're talking about a purely correlational study, but again, we wanted to test it experimentally. So to do this, we used the following experiment. Participants were told, imagine that people engage in this fictional hobby that we'll call flubbing. Although it's safe to flub for a few minutes every week, doctors warn there are serious health risks associated with flubbing for a longer period of time. On the following pages, we're going to sequentially show you the amount of time different people have flubbed in the past week. In total, you'll see information about 100 different people. So I'm not going to show you 100 different people, but I'll show you a bunch of people. So for each amount of flubbing, you, you're, you're told how good it would be to flub that amount. And you're, you're just getting a basic sense of like what's good and bad, and also what's the average. Same participants are told, before we get to the main questions, who cares? Just what's the first number of minutes of flubbing that comes to your mind? There's no need to deliberate about this. As there's no correct answer, we just generally want to know what number of first pops into your head. So participants in this in this particular case were shown a distribution that looked like this. So the minutes that they saw are sampled from this Gaussian distribution with a mean of 50. And then um, the ideal is sort of, uh, the adjustments about how good they are are sort of linearly decreasing from this ideal that's 20 or below. So, so you're getting ever lower grades as you get to 80 or so. So then the question is just, what number first comes to mind? So if the distribution of numbers that came to mind were just sampled from the dist actual statistical distribution that you observed, then the distribution of people's response about what comes to mind should look kind of just basically like this. Or if they were sort of in proportion to idealness, that people think of the ideal things more, and they have a lower probability of thinking of the ever worse things, then the distribution of people's responses should look like this. But there's also this third possibility, where people are somehow mixing these two things together. They're kind of mixing together the information about the statistics with the information about the ideal. What we actually observe is this. So the distribution of people's responses about what comes to mind is clearly there's a mix of the statistical information and the prescriptive information. So based on some pilot data, we developed this really simple model of people's judgment about what comes to mind. And the model was just that you get what the probability of something comes to mind just by multiplying its goodness by its um, statistical frequency. So the idea is, for any given point, you can think about the probability density at that point and the idealness of that point, just as a number. Then you multiply those two numbers, and then you renormalize so the total probabilities come out to one. If you do that, so if you develop a, a model that just this is very straightforward, they multiply it as well, then the model predictions come out like this, which is a pretty good fit to the data. So of course, it might not be that impressive that, the that we fit the data correctly in just this one case, but we looked at four different cases in which we do, which are varied in two different ways. One is that we sometimes have the ideal be the lower number, <coughs> and sometimes we have the ideal be the higher number. And the other is that sometimes we have the, dis the statistical distribution be roughly Gaussian, and in other cases we have the statistical distribution be bimodal. And then across these four cases, we always get this multiplicative model fitting the data at least relatively well. So we're finding at least now some evidence for this larger claim that people's, that this sense of like which the probability of something coming to mind somehow are proportionate to its normality, which in turn explained in some way by something about the statistical and prescriptive facts about that. Okay, so so far we've been suggesting this kind of picture, and then the key idea was that this picture is going to play a role in how we think about all sorts of different stuff. So if that's right, it's going to affect our judgment about all sorts of different things insofar as they're related to these kinds of, kinds of issues. So it's not possible to talk about that just in a perfectly general way. So what I'm going to do is just take up one case study. I'm going to take up this case study of how people think about causation. So the question is just, if people are just trying to think, did this thing cause this thing, in what way do they make that kind of judgment? And here I'm going to be talking about some work with Jamie Lugari, Jonathan Phillips, Jonathan Kinsky, and Thomas Eckhart. So before I go on, I just want to say, say a quick word about this. So we're talking about just this one thing about causal judgment. But before we do that, I just want to sort of give this really big, big picture of kind of vision of why we're thinking about all this stuff. 
which comes out of this much larger kind of question in moral psychology. So we're going to sort of situate this one like very specific thing that we're doing in moral in uh, about causation in this much larger picture. So the sort of ideas we're going to kind of zoom out, talk about this really big thing, and then we're going to zoom back in, just talk in a really technical way about just this one little tiny part of that big thing. Okay, so what is the big thing? So the big thing is when people are making judgments about morally significant situations, it feels like there are these different kinds of judgments can make, people can make. So different ways that people can think about these situations. So if we want to think about these different kinds of judgments, maybe it's helpful to think about a particular example. So suppose you have this really annoying boss, and your annoying boss is just like doing stuff that causes problems for you. Then you might think of, you might think about different kinds of questions regarding this, the bad thing your boss did to you. You might think, you know, did he do this freely? Or was it just that he was told in turn by his boss and was forced to do it? Or you might think, did this cause certain further downstream effects that caused problems for our whole work group, or did it, was it not caused by that? Or did he do this intentionally, or was he just unintentionally causing problems for us because he just had no idea what he was doing? Or did he do something wrong, or was he what he did totally permissible? Did nothing deserve blame for the thing he did, or should he not be blamed for it? Should he be punished for this thing, or is this not the kind of thing he should be punished for? But then, at least intuitively, you might think, even though there's all these different kinds of judgments, these different kinds of judgments fall into two basic kind of types. There's two like types of judgments. There's a really important kind of distinction between them. So you may think these judgments are moral judgments. In order to make these kinds of judgments, you have to think about what's really right and wrong, who's like, what's good and bad, and so forth. But then you might think these other judgments are just deeply different kind of judgments. These other kinds of judgments, these are just these purely descriptive judgments, just a purely factual question whether these things apply. It's nothing to do with morality. It's a totally different kind of question. And then one thing that's really been uncovered by a whole lot of different kinds of research over the past two decades or so in, um, in moral psychology is that that intuitive picture is totally wrong. That's, there's nothing right about it. It feels like what's going on is that this sense that these things are completely descriptive and that our moral judgments play no role in them, just mistake it. Rather, in people's ordinary moral, ordinary way of making sense of the world, there's this, this sense in which all this stuff is kind of bleeding together. That these prescriptive judgments or moral judgments are actually playing a role in these um, kind of in with people ways of thinking about these questions that might initially seem to be entirely descriptive. So this kind of research has mostly explored each of these different kinds of questions independently. So there's a whole bunch of research on people's judgments about freedom, judgments about whether you did something freely or whether you were forced to do it in some way. In these uh, research, it's discovered something really interesting that is not just a purely descriptive matter. It's also affected by people's moral judgments. So whether you think something's morally right or wrong, in some way affects whether you think they did it freely or unfreely. And then separately from that, there's been a whole bunch of research on whether one thing caused another. And this research shows that your judgments about just what seems like this purely descriptive factual question, just did this thing cause this thing, can be affected by your moral judgments, whether this thing is good or bad. And separately from that, there's a whole bunch of research on whether people did something intentionally or unintentionally. And that also seems to be affected both by these descriptive facts and also by these moral judgments. So then, this is this kind of topic is something that my lab has done a lot of work on, and also just lots of other researchers have done a lot of work on. Many different people have made an important contribution to this. But a core question you might face now is, why is all of this stuff happening? So it just seems like across all of these different things that feel like different kinds of judgments, we always find the same pattern, that this mix of kind of descriptive and prescriptive judgments, or descriptive judgments and moral judgments are all playing a role. So it could just be a coincidence. It could be that there's just a totally separate reason why they affect judgments of freedom, from why they affect judgments of why they do something intentionally, from why you do affect judgments about why you cause something. But at least one intuitive possibility is that that's not right. That there's some basic way human beings make sense of the world. This fundamental way of making sense of the world is playing a role in all of these different things. And then both descriptive judgments and moral judgments play a role in this thing. And that, in turn, is why both descriptive and moral judgments play a role in all of these different um, judgments. So the core idea that we've been exploring in recent work is that that core thing is this notion I've been talking about so far. This notion of normality. That there's some notion that people have just what's the normal thing to do. That's this mix of the descriptive and the moral. And more specifically, it's a mix of the statistical and the prescriptive. And this one thing ends up affecting which stuff you think about. So which possibilities you consider versus which ones you don't. And then which stuff you think about plays a role in all of these different things. So as a result, all of these different things end up being a mix of statistical and prescriptive. OK, that was like this gigantic vision that would take many papers in order to, to argue for. Oh, sorry, I, I will take questions at the end of this little module. But in this talk, I'm not going to argue for that really a big thing. I'm just going to take just, just this one case, just the case of position, and try to suggest just in that one case, there's some reason to think that this kind of big vision is right. 
So to get a sense of what we're trying to understand, maybe I'll just talk about this really, really simple experiment that just gives this basic sense of how prescriptive things, things about what's, what's good and what's bad, can play a role in people's causal judgments. So in this experiment, <laughs> participants were randomly assigned to get one of two vignettes. In the norm violation vignette condition, they got the following vignette. The receptionist in the philosophy department keeps her desk stocked with pens. The administrative assistants are allowed to take the pens. But faculty members are not supposed to buy their own. <laughs> the administrative assistants typically do take the pens. Unfortunately, so do the faculty members. Their receptionist has repeatedly emailed them reminders that only administrative assistants are allowed to take the pens. On Monday morning, one of the administrative assistants encounters Professor, Professor Smith walking past the receptionist's desk. Both take pens. Later that day, the receptionist needs to take an important message. But she has a problem. There are no pens left on her desk. Smith's fault. Oh, nice. And the participants in this condition are just asked the following question. Do you agree with the following statement? Mm -hmm. Professor Smith calls a problem. And then they just rate their agreement with that statement on a scale of one. The participants in the other condition, in the no violation condition, get a case that's exactly the same, except for that Professor Smith's not doing anything wrong. So in this condition, here, are the report. Both administrative assistants and faculty members are allowed to take the pens. And both administrative assistants and faculty members typically do take the pens. The receptionist has repeatedly emailed the reminders that both administrators and professors are allowed to take the pens. And then participants are again asked the same question, do we the professor spin across the board on a scale of one to seven? So just to give you a sense of what's going on in this case, so there's this problem and what results, that there's no pens left on the desk. And then there are these two different people, Professor Smith and the administrative assistant. This problem is, as we say, counterfactually dependent on both of them. That is to say, if either of these people had acted differently and not taken a pen, the problem wouldn't have arisen. And the only thing that's varying between conditions is just whether Professor Smith is doing something wrong. So in one condition, she's doing exactly what she's supposed to do. In the other condition, she's kind of doing something wrong. She's like violating the wrong. So if we now look at the results, what we find is this. That in the norm violation <laughs> condition, participants tend to say that Professor Smith caused a problem. And in the condition where she's not violating the norm, participants tend to say that Professor Smith's not causing a problem. So what's going on in this case? The key thing to notice is these two vignettes differ not in anything about the statistics of what either of these people are doing. They don't differ in terms of anything about the causal causal um, relationship between what they're doing and the outcome. In both cases, if they hadn't done the thing, the outcome wouldn't have re re resulted. What they differ in is just that in this case, the professor is doing something wrong. In this case, the professor is not doing something wrong. And then over time, there's just been a large body of evidence suggesting that prescriptive judgments really do affect um, causal judgments in this way. So first of all, it doesn't, there are just numerous further vignettes. So it doesn't have anything to do with professors and pens. And if you try it with other things that don't involve this exact kind of case, you get exactly the same result. Secondly, you get the same result when you look at individual differences in moral judgment. So you look at people who have different views about abortion or different views about euthanasia, and then you take, give them a case in which some abortion or euthanasia occurred, and then there were some further outcome, and then you just ask them a straightforward causal question. Just did this thing cause the outcome? Then, Participants who have these different kind of moral views have correspondingly different views about what seems like this straightforwardly causal question. And then finally, I should emphasize that you get these effects even controlling for statistical frequency. So for example, if you tell participants that the professors are not supposed to take the pens, the administrative assistants are allowed to take the pens. But as it happens, the administrative assistants never take the pens, and the professors always take the pens. <laughs> then participants still tend to say that the professor was the one who caused the problem. OK, so why is this happening? So I should emphasize, so far what I'm talking about is not controversial. I feel there's been a whole lot of research on this, which is really clear that prescriptive judgments in some way affect causal judgments. There's a lot of controversy about why they do it. What's the explanation of it? So the particular hypothesis that I want, we want to offer is that it's not that prescriptive judgments are affecting causal judgments because there's something distinctively prescriptive about them, because of the way they play a role in blame or moral judgment, but rather because people just don't make such a big deal out of the distinction between prescriptive judgments and statistical judgments. These all get blended into this one thing, normality judgments, and it's that that's playing a role in people's causal judgments. So how are we going to do this? So broadly speaking, we're working with sort of a leading view about how people make causal judgments, which is this counterfactual theory of causal judgment. So counterfactual theory in causal cognition. So the counterfactual theory says something like this. If you want to know whether Professor Smith caused the problem, what you do is you think about a counterfactual. You think about some other way things could have gone. So there's the thing Professor Smith actually did, and the thing the administrative assistant did, the situation that actually obtained. You're thinking about some other possibility. And then you think, what would be the outcome in this other possibility? And then thinking about that helps you figure out whether Professor Smith in the actual world caused this outcome. So as one possible example, maybe you think, what if Professor Smith hadn't taken the pen? Then there wouldn't have been a problem. So therefore, Professor Smith actually taking the pen did cause the problem. 
So this is, broadly speaking, this kind of counterfactual approach to causal cognition, which is probably the dominant approach at this point. So how are we going to work out the details of this counterfactual approach? A long time ago, many decades ago, one kind of view that a lot of people had was that in order to figure out whether one thing causes another thing, all you have to do is think about some very small set of counterfactuals. Only a very small set of counterfactuals are relevant. In particular, you might even think that only one counterfactual is relevant. So you might think, if you're trying to figure out whether C caused E, all you have to do is think, what if C hadn't happened, would E not have happened? So then, if you thought this was right, the obvious way that people would solve the problem, would think about the, this kind of issue, would be that there's this very small set of counterfactuals that are relevant, maybe just only one, you just consider all of them. You just consider every single counterfactual that's relevant. That's how the human mind thinks about this kind of question. But within recent work, there's been a, a growing sense that that's not right. So there's been a growing sense that in order to figure out whether one thing causes another thing, you have to think about there are an enormous number of different possibilities that would in some way be relevant. An enormous number of different counterfactuals that would in some way be relevant to thinking about this. So if you want to think whether C caused E, you don't just think, what if C hadn't happened? Would E have happened? You might think, what if C had happened, but in a different way, at a different time, or at a different speed? Or you might think, what if C had happened, but the background conditions had been different in a certain way? And then all of these things are in some way relevant to asking whether C caused E. So this is, at this point, by far, this sort of dominant approach to thinking about how, how causal cognition works, that a large array of different counterfactuals are relevant. So if you thought this was right, that a large array of different counterfactuals are relevant, you might think it's not possible to solve the problem of figuring out did C cause E, but just by considering every single one of them, every single one of these counterfactuals. So how do people actually solve this problem? The suggestion we want to make now is that they probabilistically sample from the relevant counterfactuals. So if there's this huge set of different counterfactuals that are relevant, you can't solve this problem by exhaustively considering every single one of them, but there's a certain probability for each one that you'll think of them. For some counterfactuals, there's a really high probability that you think of it. For other counterfactuals, there's a really low probability of thinking about it. And then you're thinking about a bunch of different counterfactuals. I don't know, maybe you think of three of them. And you think of these three counterfactuals, but you're sampling them from this probability distribution, where some are have, you have more of a chance of thinking of, some you have less of a chance of thinking of. So probably this is sort of intuitive, right? In the case that I just described, you might think, what if she hadn't taken the pen? Or you might think, what if the industry of not have to take the pen? But you wouldn't think, what if they're force of gravity had not existed? What if the sun had gone supernova? What if people didn't use pens, but instead wrote things by using pizza or something? Mm -hmm. You just don't think of these other possibilities. OK, so with this possibility, this sort of broad idea in mind, you can now give at least the rough sketches of an account of how normality is going to affect how the general. So the suggestion is going to be this. We are arguing that people's judgments about what's normal are in some way affecting their kind of factual, uh, causal judgments. And the way that this is going to work is that, that there are these counterfactuals people can think of, and people have different probabilities of thinking of different counterfactuals. They're more likely to think of some, less likely to think of others. Then what's normal affects which counterfactuals people think of. They're just more likely to think of normal counterfactuals. They're less likely to think of abnormal counterfactuals. And then which counterfactuals people think of in turn affects which causal judgments people make. So in our actual work on this topic, we don't just give this like nebulous sketch in my account. We try to work out a really specific algorithm that involves sampling, how people sample from these different possibilities. You're thinking about some counterfactuals and not other counterfactuals. You try this a bunch of times, and then um, it, the, as the um, number of times that you try, the number of iterations increases, it converges to this causal strength measure. And then what we try to argue is that if you look really carefully at the details of people's causal judgments, that the patterns of people's causal judgments are sort of predicted by this causal strength measure. What I'm going to talk about today isn't like all these details of exactly how this kind of formal algorithm works, but more just the core intuition, just basically how is it supposed to go. So think about these two cases, the case in which the, industry, the professor does something bad or the professor does something good. Then the core intuition is that of all the different counterfactuals people could, could think of, there's something special that's related to the causal judgment about one particular counterfactual. This one counterfactual has this kind of special role in people's causal judgments. And what is this one counterfactual? It's the counterfactual in which people consider the possibility that she doesn't take the pen. So the more you think about that kind of factual, the more you think, what if she hadn't taken the pen? The more you're going to think that she caused the outcome. So the suggestion is going to be, suppose you consider this case. You could have thought, what if the administrative assistant hadn't taken the pen? You could have thought, what if the receptionist had just put more pens there in the first place? Or you could have thought, what if the professor hadn't taken the pen? Then the more you think about this counterfactual, the counterfactual, what if the professor hadn't taken a pen, the more you regard the professor as causal. The more you think of these other counterfactuals, like what if there had just been more pens there in the first place, the last thing <coughs> you think of the professor as the cause of the outcome. 
So then the next suggestion is going to be that the probability of thinking about that counterfactual is not the same across these two cases. Rather, in the case where she's doing something wrong, there's going to be a very high probability of thinking about that specific counterfactual. And this follows from this arch's general account of the probability of certain things coming to mind. In the case where she's specifically supposed to not take a pen, then the possibility of her not taking a pen is prescriptively good. It's the thing that she's supposed to do. And the suggestion is going to be that the more something is prescriptively good, the higher probability there is of thinking about it. So that in this condition, the condition where she's doing something wrong, there's going to be a really high probability of thinking about this kind of function. By contrast, in the other condition, the condition in which the um, professor is not doing anything wrong, and there was no reason why she should have not taken a pen. People might think of that counterfactual, but they also might think of other counterfactuals. They might think of their counterfactual, what if the administrator this is not to take a pen? Or what if there just been more pens? So the probability of thinking about this specific counterfactual is going to be lower. So the core idea is, when you think about this counterfactual, you get the same answer in both cases about what would happen, but just the degree to which you're thinking about that versus thinking about something else is different across conditions. And it's that difference, the difference in the degree to which you're thinking of this kind of actual, that plays a role in these judgments. So to go after this kind of question, we did again a whole bunch of studies, but I'm just going to talk about one. And in this study, we used mediation. So participants were given either the norm violation case or the no violation case. And they're asked this causal judgment question, which is, did she cause the problem? But then participants were also asked this additional question. It's just a question directly about the relevance of a particular kind of actual. So then this mediation question, the question about counterfactual relevance, was this. Participants were told, OK, imagine all this happened. And now imagine two people are discussing the thing that just happened. And one person says, well, you know, I wonder what could have gone differently. And the other person says, well, Professor Smith could have just not taken a pen. And then the first person says, really? Of all the ways things could have gone differently, do you really think that's the one that's <laughs> worth thinking about? So, Participants were then asked whether they agree, which of those two people they, they agree with. To what, you can, to, to, to what extent do they agree that that thing is not worth thinking about? So it's kind of, as it were, a measure of counterfactual irrelevance. So what we find now is that, just replicating the previous study, this is a very unsurprising result. The norm violation, again, predicts causal judgment. So that just means people more think that she caused it when she violated the norm than when she didn't violate the norm. But also, importantly, then Norm violation predicts counterfactual irrelevance, so that the more um, people say that she violated a norm, the less they think it's irrelevant to consider that kind of counterfactual. So in other words, we were just judging of everything that's worth thinking about, to what degree is it worth thinking about the possibility that she didn't take a pen. The more it was wrong for her to take a pen, the more you think that is exactly the thing we should be thinking about. The more it's not wrong, the more you think, yeah, why would you think about that? Why not think about something else? And then, this kind of factual relevance is in turn predicting the causal judgment. And then we get significant mediation, whereby the impact of one violation on causal judgment is partially mediated by this kind of factual judgment. So, so at least providing some evidence now for this broader kind of theory, according to which the, the effect that we're seeing on people's causal judgments arises because people's causal judgments are affected by which kind of factual they think of. The more you think of certain kind of factuals, the more you regard certain things as causes. The more you think of other kind of factuals, the more you regard other things as causes. Which thing kind of factuals you think of is in turn sort of affected by normality, or maybe someone disagree and say we should just shouldn't distinguish between these two things. There's just what you think of and what's normal is just the same thing. And then which things you regard as normal are in turn affected by both statistical and prescriptive considerations. So the prescriptive considerations of you are affecting people's causal judgments. And the way they're affecting people's causal judgments is by just affecting the probability of people considering certain possibilities as opposed to others. There's this tricky fact about human beings that they tend to delegate minorities. The things that people observe to be statistically infrequent, people tend to regard also as in some way bad. So anyone who's been to middle school has the sense that there's just like these statistically frequent ways of behaving, statistically infrequent ways of behaving, and then middle school kids tend to think anyone who's behaving in these infrequent ways, just doing weird things that are statistically abnormal, they regard those things in some way bad. So now the question is, why do people do that? Why do people think that unusual, infrequent things are bad? So if you just thought there are two separate things within our minds, we have a capacity to think of statistical norms, and we have a capacity to think about prescriptive norms, then you might think, this fact about us that we derogate statistical minorities involves some kind of weird kind of causal relation between them, where there are these two separate things in our mind, but then this one is somehow affecting that one. But there's another way of thinking about their problem that is very different, that you might think, there's really just this one thing in our mind. There's this single thing in our mind 
that's kind of this undifferentiated blend of those two things. There's no shame just what's normal. So we have this sense that just certain ways of behaving are normal, certain ways of behaving are abnormal. And except on special cases, we're not kind of carefully distinguishing this statin thing from this prescriptive thing. And you start to understand it that way, it might not seem that weird to think that um, that there could be this tendency to derogate uh, statistical minorities. It's not that, that we think their statistically actions are statistically infrequent and therefore dislike them. It's that we think their actions are abnormal. Where abnormal is just kind of this undifferentiated mix of these two things. And then finally, I think that some of these kinds of um, phenomena we've been discuss discussing can help, at least to some degree, in making sense of some of the really unusual things that are happening in today's political life. That one of the sort of key notions that we see in this the time of Trump is this kind of big debate around normality, around the idea of what is normal, and of people trying to hold on to a certain sense of certain things as being normal and other things as being abnormal. I think one way to sort of into this problem is think about the difference in the United States between two different kinds of political debates that we observe. So one kind of political debate we observe is these kind of debates about, say, fiscal issues, where people on, who, are, uh, uh, who are more conservative views are trying to introduce certain kinds of changes to, say, repeal and replace Obamacare or to introduce certain tax cuts. People who have more liberal views think that those things are wrong. In these kind of cases, often we find is that both sides agree that this is the kind of thing that's worth discussing. It's the kind of thing where there should be a debate about it. And then, even though they both agree that this that you should think about different alternatives, you know, repeal and replace versus just preserve, that they just can't come to different decisions. That some people think we should do is preserve, other people think that you should do is repeal and replace. In other kinds of cases, though, in this in this scene, these kinds of debates take a really different character. Where in contemporary America, sometimes conservatives are doing are launching certain kinds of initiatives, doing certain kinds of things. Where liberals think it's not that you should reflect on whether you should do that and decide not to, it's that you should never have reflected on whether you should do that at all. Uh -huh. Just even thinking about that possibility shows that there's something wrong about you. You shouldn't have thought, should we do that? And then said, no, there's a reason not to do it. You should have never thought about it in the first place. And the sort of rallying cry of liberals who think about this kind of thing is this thing is not normal. It's just not normal to do this kind of thing. So, what do people mean when they say in this way, this is not normal? It seems like the way to understand the second debate is in a really different way. It's that Certain liberals are thinking these things are things that we shouldn't be considering at all. If people start doing these things, it changes not just that people happen to do them, it changes the degree to which people see them as normal, and therefore the degree to which they enter the sphere of things that we're even considering as possibilities. And conservatives often maybe have the opposite view. They think liberals have traditionally sort of wiped that off of the sphere of things that we're even deliberating about. We have to do is change the sphere of things that we're thinking about so that we actually start considering these other possibilities and actively deleting them as opposed to just ruling them out off your own. Okay. So thanks again to all of my collaborators, and thank you so much for having me.